Welcome back to the show, everybody. He's back. Arlen Roth, master of the Telecaster. We finally got him back on the schedule. He's back, and we're going to have him here for the full show, for the full hour. So we got Arlen Roth here. He's going. We're going to be talking music. We're going to be talking cars. We're going to be talking guitars. We're going to be talking just about upcoming tour dates, pretty much everything around the music. You know, I'm. this is a nod to Mark Eddy. He's going to be on the show as well. He's his his boss on his show does not let him do the music shows. And so he's always, always, you know, pitching them for me. And like I said, I'm, I'm always willing to throw him a bone every now and then and bring him on and you know, show off my inexperience and in, inability when it comes to these things. Cause pretty much, I know it has six strings. I know it makes music, but the, the rest of the stuff, I really can't, you know, really can't tell you how it works, but guess who can the master of that telecaster, Arlen Roth. And he's now. Yeah. Welcome to the Three Beards Podcast. My name's Craig, along with Austin and Chris. Passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century. Let me out. Chris is with us here. I think Austin can hopefully join us here um, soon. We're not sh- not sure yet. Here, um, you got. Let's see. We got, all right, Pro- producer um, producer's hey, mouse just doing, died, man? so he wasn't able to bring it on. Yep. So it's, uh, it, hold on one second here. Yep, we got a little bit of a little bit of a snafu right there. The producer's equipment just died on us right as we're going into the show. So hey, that's 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 a way to start it off. So let's bring on Mark at the same time. How are you? No, I'm doing well. How are, how are you, Craig? Good. How's the moonshine business going on there in West Virginia? I, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to talk about that live on the air. <laughs> uh, Moth, yeah, Mothman stuff was uh, great. Oh, okay. Well, right, is that what, is, is that what the brand of moonshine has been called? The Mothman? Yeah, that's it. All right. All right. Hey, I'm just trying to make sure I'm up on the code. All right. So, all right. Let's bring on Arlen Roth at this time. How are you, sir? Good from Mothman to Rothman. That's right. Hey, it's, it works. It works. Hey, I, for winging it, that wasn't too bad of an intro. I said, I can't find the one I wrote down. So I, I, for, I, I liked it. Yeah. I, I thought it, I thought it went off pretty good. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to go with it. Yeah. All right. So. Yeah, so the master of the Telecaster. That's where we we kind of left off when you were with us. Um, I want to say it was July. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, as in that, in you you were just in the process of talking to Chris about the Les Paul, the Strat, and the Telecaster. How yeah. they pretty much right from the go, you know, their first try at it, they got it right. You know, and there's Ooh, yeah. And so do you, do you think that's why they, you know, you really haven't seen too much in the way of like inno- innovation when it comes to that, like in designs, just because they're like, if it's not broken, why fix it? I mean, it's just, we love well, this thing. Yeah. It has a lot to do with that. Also, the fact is because these are the solid body guitars, which do not require, you know, an actual hollow body for the sound. So right away, you're talking about something that's really a plank of wood making the sound so you're talking about the pickups the two pickups or three pickups or one pickup you know the strings which then become magnetized by the pickups and all and the other stuff and the way you switch to the pickups so really 
it just boils down to the shape and the size in terms of um, why the first three were so innovative. It's like, think about all the changes they went through and they just were right. You know, the Les Paul, the Telecaster, which originally started as the Broadcaster and the Strat, Stratocaster. Why is that? That's because if they had to be hollow, they would have had to add a much more guitar-like shape, you know? And of course that keeps changing now too. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, then there was the ES the ES series by Gibson, which I think was the most innovative on top of all of this. With those are the ones with the two the two horns like this. And they, they have two F holes, so they're hollow on the sides, but they're solid in the middle. So they're still utilizing the uh, solid body technology. So that's really what it is. It's just because, I mean, it's not just a fluke that the first three were right, you know. That was really kind of like all you could come up with at that time, you know. Yeah, and the I think it was the '80s is when it really took off. You had no. is almost well, no, I was I was what I'm getting to is oh, like the '80s, the, the gimmick. You get oh. the gimmick guitars where you have right. you'll have like those '80s rock bands where the guy will have like three necks right. off the guitar, and it's just and so that was one of the things. Was, so you as like a professional guitar player, is there really any practicality for having that? I mean, because can't oh. you just yeah, can't you just have a pedal to do the effect no, no, of no. the pedals? The pedals are another problem to deal with. Yeah. You know, what happened with that is that you know you you had to have a, a six string with one neck, and then the other neck is a twelve string. We so have a six string and a twelve string, two different, two totally different sounds. When Danny Gadden played with me on Conan O'Brien, he had a six string and a baritone. You know, so the two necks are like really like two different guitars, two different tonalities. And Joe Mathis in the old days, who was like a contemporary of uh, Merle Travis's, he had a really good, he had like a Moserite guitar, which I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, there's a, there's a double or a triple neck. Yeah. But Joe Mathis had a neck where when it ended, the second one kept going. So you can go higher and higher and higher, you know? That was yeah. That was and it, so this the guitar. First neck, the first neck would end up here, and then go to the start of the second neck, and now you're going even higher in pitch. So yeah, so, there's a lot of a lot of reasons behind it. Because I wonder, I wondered about because that's one of the things I wanted to ask you. Like one of the questions I had off off the notes that I cannot find anywhere um, <laughs> was you know it was stuff like this because like if you look at this picture, you could see you know he's got the three separate necks, but then he's also got. I'm not even sure what the purpose of it, uh, unless it's just for design. It's just, flash. It's flash. It's just you got it's those two little guitar-shaped things playing, on the bottom. He's playing by tapping. He's not. He's not picking. He's just tapping with his fingers like this on the neck, tapping. And that's, like the, all the heavy metal guys. Doo -doo 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 -doo, you know. Yeah, because then you've got you know you've got some of the. I think it's a joke. I honestly think it almost seems all, like a. That's a it joke. It's just. That's just for show. Yeah, that always seems like a comedy routine. I mean, because I was seeing yeah. some of these things, like, how is that even physically possible? I mean, yeah. it's like, well, Rick Nielsen from Cheap Trick, he used to, he was the first one to use that sort of as a gag, you know, as a comedy thing. And yeah, that's it, what it is. It almost looks like a bass guitar in the center. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> like, yeah, there's probably something there that can be used. You know what I mean? Yeah, and Arlen. You, you, since we're, you know, we've been talking about uh, you know, the du uh, double necks, and you know, Craig just showed one about six, six different necks. Um, you know, you've also had uh, a, a custom-made guitar. Uh, you, know, you, you purchased recently. How's that working? It's great. Sure. So that's an acoustic. Mm -hmm. Here it is right here. I don't know if you can see. It's just stand on the stand right here. There's a wonderful guy out in California named George Bowen who made that for me. That's a real state-of-the-art uh, acoustic guitar. And each string has its own, like, pickup, its own output if you're going to play electric. 
I mean, it's an acoustic guitar, but when you plug it in, you've got six individually tuned and, and precisely. He actually stopped in Nashville on the way coming from LA to me so he could get that installed. Because the guy in Nashville, there's a guy in Nashville who does wow. it. So what a guitar, you know, what an amazing. Because it was that, yeah, that on the neck there is the construction on that. Is that stainless? Uh, it almost like stainless steel in the light. She's I don't know if that's good. Um, well, there are inlays, you know, I mean, there's Mother of Pearl and uh, Abalone. Let's try to get this so you can see it. You know, those are the frets. They are stainless. They are stainless steel. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, yeah, it's a beautiful guitar. I mean, that's, yeah, it's like it Brazilian really is. Rosewood. Brazilian Rosewood. It's, it's, it was a two-year project. And, wow. Um, so it's a fairly new guitar, or what was the, what's the original? It's brand new. Guitar? Yeah, it's brand new. Brand new. Custom made for me by this, this master luthier. Huh. Wow. That's, yeah, I was, I was showed your site up there, Erlen Roth, and a lot of people, you can go there to get more information on him too. And so, you know, you've got the Reverend, Reverend has got, they've got their, their take on the custom cars. You, you look like you, um, your, your photos were based more on the classics, like the fully restored style. Like you, you, yeah. are you a fan of the customs or are you more of a fan of just like taking it back to the original? Oh, you're talking about the car. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The Buick. Uh, no, I, love the, I still love the originals more than anything, but what I like about the customs is they, they kind of enhance what was beautiful about the originals to begin with, you know, like that's a Buick that was customized by a very famous man back in the sixties. And I found it in a guy's garage up in Massachusetts, right near the New Hampshire border. And um, yeah, that's the interior. And um, you know, we, it was already chopped. The top is chopped and it's got a few custom touches like the tubular grill and, I added more things like the, the Dagmars and the, the interior is done to the original specs of what the custom guy did it did. It's um, his name was um, Eldon Titus, Eldon Titus. And he's the one that he built that car. I started building when he was 14 in, uh, in Wichita, Kansas. So he became a very famous customizer. He's part of a, a whole crowd of guys out there who uh, did a lot of customizing. Yeah, because there's your Telecaster. And then is that the Les Paul that you said that you had, the 52? No, that's a ES-295 Gibson, painted gold like the Les Pauls were. But that's um, like the Scotty Moore guitar. Scotty Moore played that with Elvis on the first uh, Elvis hits. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's like early 50s, 52, 53, like that. <clears throat> That's a cool-looking guitar. I always wondered what makes like heavy metal heavy metal artists. Is, I always when I was growing up, I always seen them trash guitars. It's like a five or ten thousand dollar guitar they trash. Or do you know, being in the music scene, do they take an extra guitar that night that's not as valued as the guitar that they typically just <laughs> probably bang up? Who's talking? You're in a there's a dark square here. There's a dark. There's, square. Yeah, that's Chris. He's talking. He's talking because. It's like he's he's battling not feeling well. It's, oh, it's like he was no. blacked out. Okay. Yeah, so he's I'm just on, dark. I'm on camera. I don't know why. I, saw him I don't see phone. you, man. Nope, you're you're blacked out there. <laughs> Something something's going on with your camera. Well, you know, like when I did the movie Crossroads with Steve Vai, there was a scene at the end, you know, where he's having the duel with Ralph Macchio and he keeps smashing his guitar down. Yeah, there you go. Mark's right on the case. That's right. So, throw that, that's throw that for. down. I'm well prepared for this one. <laughs> Waiter, can we have a check, please? That's right. he, he throws the guitar down. They had to keep making these guitars for him. So he kept doing that <laughs> scene over and over. So they, they would arrive. They were still wet. The guitars were still like wet red paint, you know, because he had to wow. keep smashing it. So that was pretty funny. But, uh, yeah, usually when there's a scene or something where a guitar is being smashed, it's either a dummy guitar or it's, you know, just something really, really cheap. That can be afford to be broken, you know. There yeah. he is. There you are. 
All right. <laughs> yeah, was, yeah, I know. It's one of those. I was just like, I figured he just went off camera. That's why I wasn't was saying anything. So, so just, yeah, I mean, that was a great. That was a great answer to the question I asked because I just always wondered. I mean, like I'm like yeah. wrecking four or five thousand dollar guitars. Yeah, no, no, it very rarely happens. But those kind of guitars, you got to realize they're all just. It's just a jigsaw cut piece of wood and a neck stuck on it. With a little electronics thrown in, you know, it may you may charge somebody five thousand for it, but it probably cost like forty bucks to make. You know, hmm. so. are, are, you know what are are you using the guitar you just showed us on your uh, upcoming acoustic uh, CD? Um, I will be. I will be. I've got five more songs to cut. And that's going to be used on there, as well as a guitar that I got from in England uh, called a Fylde guitar, F-Y-L-D-E. <clears throat> that's up in northern England. They make these beautiful guitars as well. Um, that's another special guitar that was just made for me. That's what the pandemic turned into. I was just getting all these custom-made guitars <laughs> coming, coming and going, you know, they... they Lots of people were, were making them for me, and I'm very proud and happy that that is. So I'm going to showcase them on the, on the new album, yeah. The new acoustic album. Yeah. What, what is the theme of this new acoustic album? There you go, that's filed, yep. Yeah. Uh, it's not really a theme, except that it's a lot, a lot of really old tunes. Really, really old tunes. And um, I'm singing a lot on the album, too. Much more so than I've sung on anything before. But a lot of stuff is old. You know, like Tampa Red and uh, Blind Blake. Like early ragtime, early blues, early country. Like... Um, 1930s time period. Yep, yeah, 20s, okay. 30s. Like uh, Norman Blake, who's from, you know... North Carolina, West Virginia, like that. He's just one of the greatest of all time. So I'm going to be using, uh, you know, using doing some of his songs. He's the kind of guy that could write a song in the 70s that sounded like it was from the 20s. You know, you think, oh, that's a really old classic song. And then you realize it was just something new that he came up with. But he has that, that knack, you know. So I'm, I just fell in love with that kind of stuff. I always have. But now I'm enjoying really playing it myself, you know. It's all just one guitar, just one guitar. I'm doing a couple of things, too, like a, an instrumental of Lady Madonna um, and a few pieces that I wrote myself, too, you know. So when well, you're performing, you talked about it a little bit um, before, yeah. too. So are you, you're pretty much, you go with, primarily just a guitar because I, it sounds like you're you're not interested in the pedal nightmare i you see those no, people that I, have the 40 45 pedals no, in front of them that. i can't stand that pedal thing i've never i've had i have one pedal in my entire arsenal i have another guitar player in my band named chris who i let him have all he loves his pedals you know yeah so i'm like chris i would like a nice kind of organ like sound right now behind me or I'd like this certain kind of thing. So he gets those textures as a, back, as a third, as a second guitar player. And I'm up there just doing my thing. You know, I might have a little echo. I may have a tiny bit of compression or overdrive, but I don't even use those, you know, just a guitar into an amp. That's it. Yeah, my brother's a um, player and he has a few, but I mean, there's some that just... It's one of those, it's kind of like seeing if you've never been to the production side of a concert and right. seeing the board, if you've never done yeah. it before, it's just like this, this foreign thing. You're like, I don't even, wouldn't even know where to begin. Like what? I know. And you, you'll see, like I <laughs> said, all these pedals everywhere. It's like, you're playing his songs. How are you paying attention? Where to put your foot and which one to press? I'm like, it just, there's so much things you have. Well, the whole like, thing becomes choreographed. You know exactly what to do at the right time, you know. I just get, I'm just happy when I can stand on one foot, hit the pedal and not fall over, <laughs> not get yeah. too busy. I'm like, what am I doing? You know, but these guys have these setups 
40, 50 pedals. And we weigh a thousand pounds to carry that thing. I think the, probably the biggest money being made right now in the guitar industry is selling those pedals. Mm -hmm. See, for me, I've got to have the guitar that actually that pedal is trying to imitate. So I'll come to a session, my own session. I come with like eight guitars, you know, because I want the authentic sound. I don't want the sound that the pedal makes. <clears throat> Well, that, so that's, that is where you get from, like, the, yeah, you get from a performer and you get to a, somebody that's a master, you know, of the thing. I come from a different era. Yeah. I come from a different era, you know. These guys, it's a quick chew them up, spit them out, you know. You're in a recording session. Oh, you got to give the sound at the end that the producer wants quickly. I think that's mostly a product of Nashville. You know, these Nashville guys just boom, 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 boom. Step on this, step on that. Step, you know, time's new, money's time. And yeah, they don't, they don't care that much about the authenticity. You know, yeah, studio time. We got to, you know, got to crank them in, you know, get them in. Yeah. I mean, you got an hour to get the single. Nashville's not that bad with the studio time pressure, but at the same time, you know, everybody I played with down there, my God, they got those pedal boards. Ooh, it's. It's, I mean, if they can really get good stuff out of it, I think it's impressive, you know? It really is. And there are certain things you have to worry about, like which is the chain? Which goes before one pedal? Which pedal goes before the other one? Because that's going to affect the sound, you know? Am I going to um, cause an electrical fire and burn down the venue? <laughs> <laughs> and which, you know, and which plugs in as opposed to which is using batteries, you know? All that stuff comes into play. The crowd's all cheering because they think it's part of the pyrotechnics, and it's actually yeah, right. Ford melting down. Ah, I believe <laughs> it. Yeah, yeah. Those are Spinal Tap moments they try to avoid. <laughs> spinal Tap. <laughs> yeah, or, or, Arlene, you, you were just saying you're from a, a different era, and sure, uh, 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 I mean different than the guys that are starting now. You know. Yeah, no, I, I understand, and. You know, when you did your side guitar summit CD, guitar summit. yeah, um, okay, um, that's like Rocket eighty eight is what, what from uh, the late forties or fifties. Nineteen fifty. Okay. I actually drive a Rocket eighty eight, a nineteen fifty. I have one. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's about a car. You know, it's about a car. And you know, Amazing Grace is uh, what? Uh, maybe what? When they're written, uh, it, it's an old song. Is it uh, sure. over a hundred years? It's probably over a hundred years old. Well, it's a, it's a it's a standard. It's a historic song. You yep. know, I, I did that with Greg Martin. Yeah, and we did sort of a bluesy take on it. That we wanted to do, but. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, that's a standard. You know, you could approach that song anyway. Okay. You want, you know. It, it, uh, but you were talking about with the um, acoustic CD that you're working on yes. now. You're going back uh, e even a little bit farther than the ones from uh, Slide Guitar Summit. What are. Um, How did those songs just maintain their appeal from over uh, right. ninety to a hundred years later? Yeah. You, you, you it's really, know. very simple, Mark. It's just a good song is a good song. You know, a great melody is a great melody. Um, sometimes you want to evoke those old chord changes. Like when I played with Sebastian, when I just did this album with John Sebastian, a lot of the Love and Spoonful songs use those kind of ragtime. Mm -hmm. there, and there it is. Those ragtime chord changes, you know. So He's even with his writing, he was evoking earlier songs. Yeah. yeah, yeah uh, it's just yeah, well, ongoing, you know. The, the influence of one one writing, <clears throat> writing, 
one period to another period. It all keeps getting rehashed and reused, you know, like that. Yeah, it's like, you know, it it's so old, it's new. Right. T- yeah. Everything but, old is getting new again. Yeah, it, and, and, you know, because like I'm going to be doing, like when I did Peach Pickin' Time in Georgia on that album, on Slide Summit, that's a Jimmy Rogers song from the 20s, you know? But maybe nine out of ten people who heard my my album never knew that song before. So it's brand new again. And I lo- I did it for Greg because, you know, the head- headhunters are always doing those wonderful versions of older tunes. You know, they're great at that. So Spirit I, I in the Sky. Like, Spirit in the Sky, but I mean like with that they had. Yeah, they do a great Spirit in the Sky. That's really cool. Um, and the way they did, you know, um, Oh Lonesome Me, you know. Oh, lonesome me. It's just a great song from the 50s, you know? Mm-hmm. Have you ever done Baby, Please Don't Go? Baby, Please Don't Go. Yeah, because that was done by so many people from the Rolling Stones to, you know, oh, just yeah. ACDC, Aerosmith. I mean, it's like, you know, Muddy Waters was there that did it with the Rolling Stones there. I mean, I, if you have, if anybody haven't seen that video, it's pretty cool when it, just, it seems like they just walk into the club and Jagger just gets up there and just starts jamming with them. Yeah, that's and, a good uh, song. Even I know that song. And them, with you know, with Van Morrison. If you mm-hmm. don't go, if yep. you don't go, that's them. You know, that's that's about sixty-four. I think. Have you have you done that song? <laughs> no, it's just one chord. Mm-hmm. It's just a blues riff that keeps going on and on. I have done similar songs like the way I do "Treat a Right" by Roy Head. Or, um, you know, Green Onions or something like that. Songs that just have that repetitious, that, that sort of, you know, trance-like thing where it just keeps going. It doesn't even change, you know. That Baby Please Don't Go, that's what that does. One chord. It's one chord, the whole song. They said the, the Green Onions. I, that made me, I just, I, my head, it just took me back years when I was joking around with my dad. I told him, I go, the 60s and 70s, it felt like the bands were just walking through a grocery store and we were just randomly seeing stuff on the shelves, and that's how they picked their <laughs> band name. So I was like, what do you want to call yourself? Bread? Sour cream. Yeah, Let's hey. go bread. Stra- we're going to be bread. Strawberry alarm clock. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's like they're just going through stuff. It's just like the random stuff they've had in the store. That's also how they keep up their name. And I'm like, great bands, but I mean, just like... I'm like, we got a kind of a blues band going here. Hey, Clapton, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to go with Cream. Let's go with Cream. Yeah, right. Cream. Let's do it. Well, it's supposed to be the cream of the crop. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it was just all those days. I just, I liked it. You know, it's just like you have a loving spoonful. You know, you just those things. You're just, you're just like, you know, the names are so, you know, amazing. You know how they, how they come up with this. You know, came up with these things. And that was, that was pretty cool. And before, hey, before we get too long, um, further in. Somebody asked a question about the amps that you prefer for either electric or acoustic. Yeah. You know, guitars. I have uh, a lot of vintage, nice vintage uh, Fender amps, you know, um, early Princeton's. I have three periods of Princeton, the fifties, early sixties, late sixties, and the uh, deluxe reverb from 1964. Uh, I like PVs. I used to do a lot of touring for PV guitars, and I have a, a wonderful PV Classic 30 that I love using, and a Classic 50. And also my friend Paco Pasquale, who's from Spain, who brought me a special guitar 10 years ago, brought me a Telecaster. He just built me this custom Arlen Roth amp in Spain, and he brought it here from Spain. He's putting. He's the one that's putting together my European tour. So you said so you like the you like the vacuum tube sound? Oh, absolutely. Like, sure. Yeah, is is that why did that die off? I mean, it's it's, just, it's like a random thing. I mean, I get it. You just like stuff, but here you have something. It's just like you said with the Les Paul Telecaster, the Strat. Mm. How it never really died off. It's like manufacturers started making you know transistor amplifiers because it was more cost effective and everything. Yeah, cheaper. I mean, it's yeah, but. but they still kept the, the tube amps going as well. Fender never stopped it. You know, Ampeg never did. Marshall never did. 
but they all tried going into that solid state thing. And it didn't, you just, you know, some of them have a unique sound in and of themselves. It's like, I remember when I recorded with Dwayne Eddy, he, he had this um, hissing, like a uh, transistor, a PV amp that he played on my album with. So we then we worked on the thing, we mixed it, we made it some sound, we cleaned it up. He goes, hey, what'd you do? What'd you do to my hiss? What'd you do with my hiss? You took away my hiss. Mm-hmm. Oh, we better put Dwayne's hiss back. It was like, shh, 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 shh. He wanted yep. that back. So he Well, you're so it. used to that sound. Yeah, he's so, so used to it. I'm thinking, oh my God, what is this, you know, chugging along the shh, 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 shh. That's this sort of on and off, because he always played with tremolo, you know, blah, 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 blah. So the hiss is going in and out. He wanted it back. So we put Dwayne's hiss back. But that was a purely solid state transistor amp that was made for a steel guitar. Yeah, it's, I think it's just a lot of things. It's just, um, we've talked about show, it's the same way with, I'm really l- love the fact that a lot of groups are getting back to pressing vinyl yeah we're going to be pressing vinyl these because you know, it's, that has some there's something about the tower speakers with right. record player playing that thing that sound is so much better than you know the yeah this it's it just and pe- a lot of kids like in my son's age he doesn't you know they don't understand this they're so used to mp3 you know this right. they listen and they're right. like when you play that same song through the stereo and stuff so when you guys do your pressing People are going to be blown away by the sound that is going to come from that album. But especially if you go through the mastering process for analog. Mm -hmm. Because what happens now is a lot of people are putting out, you know, vinyl, but they're just putting the digital um, stuff on it, which is the worst combination. Worst combination. You have to actually go back and get it. You have to master it the old way on a lathe. You know, silver disc, making the disc. I have one that was done like that for um, All Tricked Out, Mark, that never, we never even put it out because it was too expensive to put out uh, vinyl. But, they're, they're, you know, people are buying them, though. When I go to my gigs, I've got some vinyls from my original two albums, two or three albums, and they're buying those. They're still never unpacked. Hmm. 30 bucks a piece, 40 bucks a piece. You've mm-hmm. seen them, I think I had them. May have had them on the road a little bit. Right. Yeah, I was I was just in Walmart the other day and I just saw um saw two Metallica albums sitting here. I'm like, yeah, those are coming home with me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> albums meaning vinyl. Yeah, I I saw those. I'm like, yep, those are coming home with me. I yeah. you know, so, you know so I Walmart still sells vinyl? Yeah, oh yeah. Well, because it's coming back. That's what I said. They've actually a lot of um, a lot of people have realized that the MP3, just the i, you know, just the iPods, all this stuff, it has that you've lost a layer of. The, I mean, it's just, it doesn't matter what genre. You can take rap, yeah. you can take blues, you can take rock. It just you put it on vinyl. Oh my God! There's a whole different level it's of linear. music. It's yes, linear. It keeps. It's going in time. It was created over time. Not a bunch of digital bytes that are just shouting out at you with all this noise because it's really kind of a noise that digital music makes it's a, it's kind of a now that, of now, shrill, <clears throat> shrill to the ear now that you say that there's a dj i used to work in the club many doing security whatever there's a dj he still brings his milk crates in with albums and he says i don't care if nobody don't like me playing records i play records so He's yeah. got some old school rap, but then he's got some newer stuff that's on vinyl, and it yeah. sounds better. To come to yeah, mm-hmm. I can agree. I remember I played a club in Woodstock. We had to stand on milk crates because the place was flooded. <laughs> <laughs> the whole band was standing. On milk <laughs> there wasn't any vinyl in them, though. But no, but that was. It's very true. I think that uh, you know maybe some of these kids now are so they didn't even realize that vinyl was an old thing. Maybe to them vinyl is new, and then maybe the CD will become new again. Who knows? Yeah, is what well, I think that's um, you know, Brian was there. He was, I won't be happy till eight tracks are back. 
Oh God! I have, like, one of those. I have one of those. I'm like, we. I'm getting flashbacks to the parents' car where you got the eight track thing right there, and you're slapping that looks like an Atari cassette into the car. You know, I have one still in the box. <laughs> Two old stuff. I have. Uh, I ordered two cassettes of mine this week because I have a. I drive a little Dodge Raider, an '89 that has a cassette player in it. So I found two old cassettes of two of my first albums. So I said, okay, let at least I can own them. I put it in, and it's playing like whoa, whoa. It's like it's like two times too slow. I'm like, what's oh. going on here? So maybe that's the cassette player itself. I, I like showing you kid, you, kids, you know, the younger generation right now, a, a cassette tape, and they're like, "What is this?" Oh. Mason and, had no I'm, clue. And Mason it's like, says, is, "Does anybody know what this is for?" With a cassette yes. tape, everybody knows what this is for. With a cassette tape, this from our generation. This right. is your rewinder and fixing tool. <laughs> no, I got one. I got one even better for you. When it pops, you yeah. got to take the tape apart and try to put some tape on it. Yep. Oh, kind of get it. Oh, no. <laughs> that's your favorite tape. You've played it so much. It just pops. And well, you're and like, that's going to be the part that you love of the song is where it happened to it. But in the studio, that's how we used to, you know, uh, when you would mix an album, you'd watch it go by. You have all these splices. You have to keep on splicing it. You know? Oh, yep. wow. Tape, 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 tape. And it always has to be dur during a drum, a cymbal crash. So you don't hear the splice. That's, that was the full extent of what we could do with you know, that's, that's cool you said that. I don't I don't think I ever put that together that, that I mean that makes complete sense of why you would do it at that point because that sound would mask yeah that that gap yeah I know I, th I think the only thing for me like man we're talking old school um, <laughs> sound equipment here is the reel to reel that's the only other thing that had that amazing sound yeah that I go to and then that one was that one was another one that was just a pain in the butt, rewinding the reel to reel. You know, doesn't get the things. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, that's how I started my company, Hot Licks. I found a, a used reel to reel TAC, and I started doing all my lessons on that reel to reel. Really? Yeah, sure. All the masters. It was that's 1979. The, that, is, that is awesome. I, was, I lived at a loft right beneath the World Trade Center in Manhattan. And, uh, there were all electronic stores around there. So I would go out. I, I said, okay, I'll get this tape recorder. Brought it up four flights, you know, and started recording. You know, assuming it would be, still be standing, obviously, you know, because of its location. Can you imagine what the value of that flat is th th these days? Value be, of the flat? Yeah, that, it just be it right there, that four. You where I live? Yeah, right well, there. It's still there. It's still oh. there. Oh my God! I, mean, I just, I'm just thinking because some of those penthouses are going for millions. I'm like, I can only imagine what the cost of this, this your loft. old place was. It was, it was actually right above a music store, too. Oh, uh, that that's Boston like center was straight up. You know, like I looked right up at them, straight in the sky. I was one block, one block from them. That was it. I moved You're out of there in '83, late '83. You're, you're, you literally live the musician, the musician music, you know, lover's dream that you're right above the record store where all you got to do is just we're go above down. The bar store is above the bar yeah. Store. yeah, just go down, grab the music. You know, it's like, hey, I'm going to take this upstairs and try it out. Like, it's just, hey, can I get some lessons? Yeah, just go downstairs, pick, you know, pick out the guitar. Bob will let you take it upstairs. I'm the, I'm the Dave Edmonds came to visit me. Uh, you know, they thought that Hot Licks was a store. It was just my my apartment, my loft, and I come home from teaching Paul Simon, giving Paul Simon a lesson. Come home and there's Dave Edmonds and Mickey G, his other guitar player, sitting in the living room with my wife, and they just carried up all the Hot Licks, uh cassettes from the street, from UPS. They're like, I we thought this was a music store, you know. I know you're I know you're bored and all your you know all that time you just have nothing to do you know have you thought about actually doing that store because that would be awesome the hot likes just it was oh, like actually having, go, having a store yeah and actually doing that store with something because that, that just sounds fantastic well i'd like to have a, a, a hot licks or just call it you know whatever but have a music shop but music shops are cool because they become sort of like the the pulse of an area you know the heartbeat that's where the music kind of goes in and goes mm -hmm. out 
But you know, you got to pay rent. You got to do all that stuff. You got to make sure you're you're selling enough. You know, these days everybody sells everything online, and uh, they make it like they, as if they do have a music store, but they don't. You know, but yeah, it would be a great thing to have and have people teaching again and stuff like that. But I need to see the corner shop with the Hot Licks logo, just neon, just around yeah. the side. Oh, we used to have that Hot Licks neon at every, all the NAM shows. And every year we had to have it rebuilt because it would always break in shipment. Every year, a big pink Hot Licks we had. Yeah, because I think we talked about him. We talked about in the show, last one because you did about 240 or so episodes with that and then also with about 180 you know, Audio. artists. Yeah. No, yeah, right. 240, 250 videos. Mm -hmm. And we had about 160 audio tapes before we went to video. We wow. That's a video company before there was video. I'm, I'm still, it's one of those things. You, it's, it's, I, I'm so ingrained in today. It is, it's amazing the stuff that you forget that, you know, back prior to night, you know, the early 90s, there wasn't even cell phones, you know, the mass, right, sure. mass used. I mean, it's just, you forget about these things. It's like, I yeah, wish it like, was like that again. I can't stand the cell phones, you know, everybody in the world oh. is staring at them. I was the last one. I bought the last flip phone uh, in my area. I'm like, man, I'm not going to sit and stare at that thing. Now that's what I do. I've got it. Yep. I'm staring at it like all the people crossing the street, like all the people that should be driving their cars. You know, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but it's hard. It's hard to turn, you know, because it's like one of those people's like, I wish we could go. And I'm like, but how cool is it when you're like, hey, who did that song? And all I have to do is type it in and it shows right. me. And that's, and I think that's been the problem is like all this information is so readily available. It's like, we can all do, I mean, there are the people that are just watching mindless videos as they're walking into traffic, you know, it should be, you know, but it's just, I can't tell you how it's like, if we're doing this show, how cool it is that I can immediately go over here. Just like yeah. you said, with those, those file guitars, I was able to find that, bring it up on screen and show right here. Otherwise yeah. I wouldn't have been able to get that in that time. Yeah. Everything's being done at such a rapid pace, but the problem is then everybody requires that, Yep. Rapidity. You know, so now they got this guy has to send up hundreds of damn satellites. So everybody has good wide Wi-Fi service everywhere. I mean, yep. get out of here. It's ridiculous. Yeah, know. Alan, that was brutal, man. I'm just glad we don't have those days anymore. It's like you got to send, you know, do your text where you got to hit one or two, you know, one, two, three or something like that on the, the letters. Oh, my God. That was so brutal. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have my phone. I loved it when there were you had a phone machine and you could challenge each other to have the, the funniest phone message, you know. And that would be that was it. That was cool. I mean, it's growing up where I was in eastern Oregon, our phone number on the rotary phone, that was all, you know, there was too many nines. There's a lot of nines. And so when you're trying to call somebody, he's like Shh. Yeah. <laughs> You're, you're like, and then if you screw up, you got to start over again. It's just murder. <laughs> and you're like, I'm going to do that eight more times again. It's like, oh. I still have the original <laughs> Hot Licks hotline phone. The red, it was this red phone. But it was, you know, it was a push button phone. But it still was yep. a nice. I love the, the way the phones were so nice and heavy. You know, they had a real weight. I was actually in a place a few years ago up near Ithaca, New York, up in the country there. And I went into this place, and the guy was still using a wall crank phone, you know, where you're – like you see in, like, Andy of Mayberry or something. Mm -hmm. You pick up, you know, you got the phone. Mabel, can you please yep. listen to it? it was like that. And you hear down the line the click, 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 yeah, click. Is every other uh, every other lady is picking up so they can listen? We have – we have we, – question <laughs> alert, retro. question – Question yeah. alert. We have a question from Brian Bowden. He wants to know what's your favorite acu acoustic guitar and what's your favorite ele uh, well, electric guitar? We know that's guitar. Telecaster. We can answer that one right there. It's Telecaster. Well, my favorite I'd be shocked. I mean, my favorite nothing. electric guitar that I own is a 53 Telecaster. And the best acoustic I ever had was a 1939 0018 Martin that I bought from Ry Cooter. When I was on the road with John Prime, Why Cooter, oh. Why Cooter, and I, he, he did. We did the movie Crossroads together, and um, but I didn't. Uh, I don't have that guitar anymore. But I got thirty great years out of it, 
For now, I would really say that it's Bowden, Bowen, B-O-W-E-N. And uh, I love that. And I love my Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz makes an Arlen Roth model. Santa Cruz is a guitar company from California. Uh, so that's a great one, too. I mean, I, you know, I have the luck of now they can make the guitar to my specs, what I want. So, but still the vintage stuff is really my favorite. And as we were wrapping up the uh, first time you were a guest with us, um, yeah, you were uh, just starting to talk about the uh, upcoming CD uh, Super Soul session. Uh, yeah. Where is that right now? Just waiting for two. It's all done. Just waiting on two overdubs from my daughter, Lexi. She's going to do the high harmony. She's doing the high harmonies on Higher and Higher and on Shake by Sam Cooke. And that's it. And then the album's done. It sounds absolutely incredible. With Chris Parker on drums is one of the all-time greats. And uh, Jerry Jamat, of course, on bass. He's my partner on the album. Super Soul Session. And we got a couple of them here, like this one. In your opinion, what is the greatest difference between the Tele and the Strat? Well, the Strat has three pickups, whereas the Tele had two. Uh, there are more so uh, so so sonic uh, possibilities with the Strat. You know, it's got more poss more combinations. You could have number three and one, two and one, two and three. You know, you can mix, mix and match. But I have a lot of Telecasters now <clears throat> with three pickups, so I can get Strat type combinations. And of course, the Strat has a a totally different body shape. It's very hard to sit with. If you sit with a Strat, it's going to slide away. I've done hmm. a, an album where I'm on the floor with the guitar because the guitar kept moving. <laughs> and I'm there. They didn't knew, know it, but I had to follow the guitar. A telly sits right on your leg and doesn't go anywhere. You know? so. But there, then, there's quite a difference, you know, between the and, two. And, and with uh, Jerry Jumont on the... Uh, CD, what is uh, uh, he uh, did a lot of work with uh, King Curtis? Yeah, we did some of those songs. It, it, we, did uh, what's he... we did King Curtis, Aretha, you know, uh, we did a few Aretha songs. But Jerry played on all those Aretha ones. He played, he played, we're doing things that Jerry played on in the 60s, you know. And Joe, thanks for that question, by the way. Um, now, it's the other one. I, I think Chris, Paul Reed Smith. Yeah, I think Chris, Chris just took a fall there. <laughs> I'm falling and I can't get up. Yeah, I Your know. cold is making a lot of noise, Chris, just so you know. A yes. lot of high-end uh, yeah. interference. <laughs> <laughs> just so you know. But yes. anyway, yeah, Paul Reed, there he goes. Paul Reed Smith. Um, yeah, I've played, I know him, and I performed with him uh, at the Hard Rock Cafe in New York and stuff, um, but I mostly used my telly. I didn't, I played a couple of his guitars. They're okay, I like them, but, you know, I don't, <laughs> He said they're okay. They're okay, I don't think that much about them, you know. I have a, a friend in Nashville, Michael Garvin, who I've written with, and he has a really cheap Paul Reed Smith, I think that's made in, like, Taiwan or something, but that guitar is great. It's unbelievably versatile, like really cheap, like a three hundred dollar guitar from the Far East, and it's excellent. So you never know which guitar is going to be the right one for you. You know. Yeah. And that, um, so right now, as we're um, we're getting up there, like in time wise. Um, I want to get you. So, what do you have um, coming up that you want to get the word out for people to, you know, you know? Because one, I know you have that album, like you said, you're working on that. You got yeah, You're Super just waiting Soul on a couple Session. things. Super Soul Session, which is a big album. We also have the Uptown Horns on there. Um, 
Joe Lewis Walker, Jerry Jamat, me, all kinds of, you know, soul artists. And my, uh, my acoustic album, which is called Playing Out the String. That's going to be my acoustic album. And I've got a, a, a big gig happening in New York on November 11th at the Iridium, which is a famous uh, Les Paul club. Oh, wow. Where Les Paul used to perform every week. I play there a million times. So I'll be there. And this weekend, this coming weekend, I'm playing in Arlington, uh, Massachusetts, uh, doing this thing called The Great Guitar Night. And they've got me uh, headlining that. There's about six guitar players before me. So I'm looking forward to that as well. That's going to be the first gig in a long time for me. Although I did play, I guess, when I play, about two months ago, I played up here at the Falcon. That was great. I've got a new keyboard player, uh, uh, Bruce um, Katz. Wonderful player who, you know, played with Greg Allman for many years. And in fact, he toured with Greg Allman with Jerry Jamat also. So he's playing organ and piano. I never had anybody like that in the, in the band before. I love having that dimension of having the keyboards. I always wonder. I always wonder what's so special about the older Gibsons. They're selling for like five and ten grand. What's so special about them? Some are of them are just... selling for five hundred grand. Some of them are. Well, what's special about them is that back in those days, the guitars were made much more by hand than they are now. But I've had a couple of the new ones that I loved. That that to me. I could have that for like two thousand instead of two hundred thousand, you know, and it's pretty close, you know. I remember the head of Gibson. He used to say to me, you know, he says the old stuff was so random. He says the new stuff now we can know precisely how many wines to give on the pickup, you know, oh. how what the weight should be. You know, they're more precise these days about tuning all those things they learned uh, from the old days as a new sound, you know, for, for new construction. But yeah, back in the old days, I think it was more hit or miss, but the quality was just better because they took a long time. Think about it, like who really needed an electric guitar in 1957 or 1958, you know? I mean, it just, you know, very slow, very slow, like the need for them, you know? Then you'd make one and then it would sit in the music shop for, for a year and people come oh i'm dreaming of buying that guitar one day i'm going to save up enough money to buy that guitar you know now it's like whoa watch out here they come you know i remember going to the pv factory when they were spray painting the guitars and they're like duck and the guitars are like flying around like you know like the, like the it's like a you're at a dry cleaners you know and i'm like, flying over the head, your head people know people need these guitars that quickly you know so it's like a to everybody in the in the world now knows a little bit of guitar stuff, but back oh, then, back then an electric guitar was still like a, a you know a, a, an anomaly, to say the least. Now, who's yeah. your biggest inspiration <clears throat> in, in, to make you as as a player? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> kind of got uh, you into the music music world that you know you're like this is you can kind of, kind of like this is what you know I really feel like it kicked it off for me. Well, of course, the Beatles, when they first hit it, the Beatles were everything. And then I was in love with, uh, I loved a lot of the classical players, Andre Segovia. I loved a lot of the flamenco. That's when my father would play the flamenco records in the house a lot because he, he was a great artist. And, um, and then, you know, B.B. King, Buddy Guy, Chuck Berry, Sun House, Robert Johnson, uh, you know, Clarence White of the Birds, uh, just on and on and on, one inspiration after another. Any luck? Any luck um, in progress since July of knocking off that bucket list item of Paul McCartney? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Um, no, well, you never know. It's still in my dream state. Yeah. But I think. Uh, I actually think that he is somebody that would be open to something like that, but you never know. 
Yeah, I just feel like somebody know. somebody's got to have that because I'm mean, like just it's like you're a well known name too. It's like somebody yeah. has got to be like like Arlen would love to just have a jam session with you. And that, it seems true. like that would happen. I know, I know. Maybe I'll first fly to Scotland and see if I could like find him. Right? But I mean, I think that everybody, you never know how people know you. Like mm -hmm. I remember that the first time I met Jeff Beck, you know. All Jeff Beck kept doing was talking about my albums. Like he knew all these tracks on my album. And I didn't know his stuff. I knew he was a great guitar player, but I didn't know his songs, you know? He's going, when a man loves a woman, a change is gonna come. I'm like, he just started rattling off all these tunes I did. And then I realized, yeah, because at one point my stuff was very big on the radio in England. Mm -hmm. Like the BBC used to close every night with one of my songs. Oh wow! I didn't know. Wow. I didn't know it till like eight years later when Mick Taylor of the Stones told me that. It like, seems like it might might not be that far of a you know realm of possibility that all you have to do is just pick up a thing, call the publicist, and say, "Hey, I really would like to meet Paul." That's right. If they know, the person Paul will be like, "Oh yeah, all in love." I know. You know, it could, it's very possible. It's very possible. Why not? You know. Oh yeah. And it's, it's, Mark, get on that right now, Mark. There you go. Do your job, Mark. Hey. Yeah, it's, yeah. Come on, get him on the phone. Yeah, it's a, I, I'm looking in, in my Rolodex. I, I'm not... <laughs> Roll <laughs> Look under M. Okay, uh, but uh, um, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll let me throw out a question, and I'll, I'll go back to uh, looking through my phone book. Um, <laughs> you, you, you know, you were talking about Paul and yeah, Jeff back and so, so, some of the uh, you know, more classic guys. But you know, in, in your Telemaster CD, you, know, you are working with uh, some of the younger, uh, sure. uh, up and coming, uh, but still uh, big name people like uh, Brad Paisley and Joe Bonamassa. Sure. Um, I, I, how? Are the uh, you know the younger generation of <laughs> musicians keeping blues alive? Well, they, I you know whether they are or they aren't doesn't really matter. But with the, and all the good players are the ones that know what came before them. You can hear it in their fingers, you know. Um, some of these guys are so new, they look at me as like being, oh, he's so old school. He goes way back, way back, you know. Right away, all, time keeps getting more and more condensed, you know, like condensed milk. It's like, you're only talking about like 20 years ago, you know, 30 years ago. Already they talk about it like it's 100 years ago, you know. I mean, what we think of as the 70s, when I was in the 70s, that was what the 20s were, you know. So... But, but Brad Paisley, all those guys, you know, Vince Gill, people like that, they've got those roots in the fingers, just like me. You know, because we came up playing the real stuff, you know, and loving the real stuff. You can't just start at square one and then say you've got all these roots. Like I remember when heavy metal really went out of favor, all of a sudden they all became blues guys. They were like, oh, but we're really blues players. You know, we used to listen to Led Zeppelin as if Led Zeppelin is blues, right? Like, no, you know, but they needed to, to redefine themselves so quickly because heavy metal was like as out as could be. It was, in my opinion, it was out when it first started, you know, but, but those guys, you know, they were trying desperately to show how, how deeply rooted they were in the blues and only a handful of them really were. Uh, it's... Metallica, that was the dark period when they, when they, after the Black Album, when they went on and they started doing more of the blues thing. That was that was the dark period. Yeah, that was the dark what times. We were all doing. Yeah, that's what we were all doing at that time. Yeah, it was like everyone was scrambling to to stay alive. You know. I know it's 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 one of those. It's like who doesn't like a hammer on a guitar? It's, it's especially if you're a metalhead. It'd be just like that, you know, that back picking. It's like come on. <laughs> But, you know, again, some of those guys really do have good roots with what they listen to, you know, 
back in the early days. But, um, you know, I just came up because I loved what I was listening to and I wanted to play what I was listening to, but I always had my own muse, my own sound I was trying to create. I would just grab little snapshots from here and there. I didn't want to sound exactly like somebody else. I just heard little snapshots, little, you know, little, oh, yeah, I see what that guy's about. I hear what that guy's about. Now it's going to become me, you know. So you're just learning a language. You're just learning to speak more of a language. Yeah, I think isn't isn't that kind of pretty much almost like the basis of music anyway? It's like a different language. It's like yeah, re realistically, like me, I can't I can't really converse with you the way that somebody else like that's going to be because you start playing, somebody else that knows how to play can just jump right in and start jamming with jam. you. You have you have yeah. that communication of notes. It doesn't matter if you can't. I could go to a foreign country, you know. I go to Finland. And I had the greatest band there. We just immediately started playing together, and we were boom, we we're ready to go. You know, because we're speaking that universal language. Yeah, that, yeah, I, I think that's that's perfectly you know well said because it's just, it's it just seems it's always that thing for anybody that's not that just doesn't have that. It's just, it's always just amazed me that you, when you have the pros at it, just how easily you can just be like. You know, you just yell out a key. This is what I'm going to be playing it. And all of a sudden, just boom, everybody just jumps in. You guys just start performing. And it's just like, it's it's amazing to watch. I mean, it, is, it doesn't matter did, what the genre is. I did many tours like that where we never rehearsed. I would be like, you know, with some of these folk guys or whatever. Just go on stage. I said, just start playing. Because I could hear all the changes within a millisecond of what was going on. I just knew it. And that kept it fresh. You know, like when I'm recording... Never miss my first take because the first take is the most honest, uh, my most honest, you know, take on that particular song or that solo or whatever. It's the, it's the purest emotion. The minute you do it a second time, it's already different. It's already lost that. Yeah, yeah Alan, everybody knows that's a universal. If you're in the woods and you hear banjos, you just get out. Everybody, everybody knows that's just that's a universal one. That doesn't need communication. You're just like when you hear the dueling banjos, then you really need to start worrying. I played with those guys. I played with with that band at um, a party for the Hell's Angels. This guy was cracking a whip in front of the band. Play dueling banjos now, and he's cracking a whip. He's oh a gosh. Viking. He's a Hell's Angel guy in a Viking outfit. Hell, you know. I swear to God. And I'm there with my guitar. Okay, we'll play whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not going to play that. <laughs> that yeah, hey, I, that, all right. Well, let's do it again. And, then the and that ended up in a movie. And then the next time <laughs> I was in that club, I ended up in the Bob Dylan movie. British Folk City in, in Manhattan. Oh. But that was, yeah, that was Eric Weisberg and Deliverance. That was the name of the band. Wow. <laughs> well, no, I just, so, I mean, everybody, like I said, go to ArlenRoth.com, you know, check check them out there. It just, and if you happen to be up in the Connecticut area, you know, up near Martha's Vineyard, there's an amazing food truck that his daughter has That's going right. on there. Goldie's oh, rotisserie. Is, what a huge success. Yes. Go, go, go hit that up. Like I said, in the same time, you know, you go around this place, you're going to be able to pick up an event and actually go listen and just take in the master of the Telecaster. And Arlen a couple Roth. of other guitars too. That's right. Hey, I mean, <laughs> Who, who can't have enough guitars, right? You can't have enough. That's right. Well, so I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, we're going to be at the Iridium in Manhattan on 11 11, November 11th. And that should be a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, yeah, anybody that's up there in that area, you know, take it, you know, go make sure you stop in, you know, go in there and watch that stuff. So yeah, and I'll put up the, I'll put up the site one more time here so people can see that. And that's where yeah, the Ir Iridium is a just classic venue. Sure. Yeah, so you, was there for years. You got and everything. What right here? He, he was doing a, a a was it like Wednesday night was his night Monday to play? night Monday night what Mon Yeah. It was great. It was very smart because why tour when you can have the whole world come to see you? You know, you made it a tourist attraction in New York. Well, if I'm going to be in New York, I'm going to go see Les Paul at the Iridium. You know. So it was it was a blast to play there. Really well, thank, 
thank you again, sir. Really appreciate it. You know, my pleasure. Best to the family. I said, I'm glad we were able to make a make a go of it. I said, this is definitely why we wanted to have you back on. That was, I felt like we did you a disservice only being able to have you on for half hour. Well, last time was kind of my fault, so I apologize. Yeah. There's there was no faults. It just it, we were just we, it turned out to be a really good show. We got a we got a bore Mark to death for about 45 minutes, and then you saved him. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, guys. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Have, Thank you. Have a great right. evening, sir. Okay, my pleasure. Best of luck to, on the tour there. You too. Thank you so much. Take care now. So that's right there, like that up there. Yeah. So that was great. That was great. So, Mark, like you said, very good, very well done, very well done. So uh, you said, also did a great job. See, Arlen, Arlen was fantastic. I, I, the, uh, you know, Brian and Ma who uh, posted some questions. I think tonight's uh, Arlen was did did a terrific job of answering some some people's uh, like tech questions. Um, and it's beyond my ability to explain, but Arlen knows all that stuff, and he, um, I think did did a good job of answering everyone's. Uh, Specialty questions. Yep, the one on the on the player. I'm so I can show everybody what we're talking about. Not that anybody doesn't know what a record is. <laughs> For anybody that doesn't know what it is, I can show you. It doesn't matter which one. Right here. Yeah, yeah, right here. Is this the Metallica yeah, album? Yep. Just as far it was, it was really, it was, it was really cool because it, it's a. It was a double, double disc. It was just really cool looking vinyl. Ah! So it's just it. Frisbee. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. I'm just. It was just like. It was like old. It's like old school when I when I got it, and they came in the, the white sleeves. I'm like going, oh my god! I'm like getting flashbacks, you know. And they, you have the insert. You have the the other paper insert inside. I mean, it was just like old, old school getting an album. I'm like, how much, how much were albums in your day? $3, $2. Oh no, no. Even, even at that, um, even back then, like when the eighties, you were still, you were still spending 15. Yeah. I was going to say you know, between 15, and 20 bucks for a brand new album. Some eight tracks might have been like eight, $9. Wow! In the late seventies, yeah, you had to, you had to save up. Like I said, it wasn't something like nowadays where kids were just like, ah, "I'm going to go," you know, like today where I, you know, that day when I bought these two, where I picked them both up. I mean, it's like this: the brand new this was twenty eight dollars at Walmart for this. I mean, so I spent sixty bucks on the two Metallica albums, and so that's what I said. It's, it's, Back in that time, it's like you weren't just walking in and picking up a whole stack of albums and packing them home. I mean, there's a lot of times like you, you'll hear people stories like on this one. I, I saw one person that said, I went out and I mowed yards for a week and I saved up that money and I went down and I was able to buy the album and bring it home. And so. And that's. Um, yeah, he's where um Joe was on there. He's like, here's a, here's a question. He's like, where would you find, you know, find it best for learning songs by ear? Um, I see that would have been a good question for Arlen, actually. Um, that, I don't know. It's, a, I, I know Brian's like, you know, he, he said yes, you know, to that one, learning songs by ear. I think that's one of those things too. I mean, I know like this one, Metallica has been advertising. It's like, if you want to play Metallica, you know, play with us. You know, they didn't, there are ads where you can play along with them on a site. So there's, I'm sure there's some sites that just kind of teach you, but I mean, I have the Xbox. I got that game. I don't know if anybody read Rocksmith. Oh, I thought you were talking about Guitar Hero. No, 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 no. Rocksmith is where you're actually, it's like Guitar Hero, but you use the actual instrument. So you can use bass guitar or electric guitar or acoustic guitar you wow. plug that in there's a cord that plugs in from the xbox playstation and it has a jack that you put into your guitar and so oh, when nice. you're actually playing 
so you have to tune it to the game and then when you actually play it it's actually doing like the guitar hero you're doing the same thing like you're seeing all the keys but it's not the stupid you know blue red green you know and you're just got the little thumb paddle that you're you know and it's like i'm a guitar player no <laughs> no 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 yeah it's, but that it was one of those i think the biggest problem like for me is you know fat fingers and so it's hard to it's hard to get to the chords that's and so that's a yeah it's it's a yeah joe i be, we would love it if we could get to a thousand views a week that would be amazing so let's make that happen like subscribe <laughs> fair <laughs> we would we would not yeah, turn it down now these are great shows uh -huh, i know I, I i have i had fun I was glad he was able to do that. And like I said, I hope everything goes really good with that. I don't think it did too bad not having my notes, by the way. I, I thought your intro was uh, well done being uh, impromptu. Yeah, I was, I was, that was, yeah, that, that was, that was one of those like, I'm, I'm just going to go for it. I had it all written down, but I can't find it. I'm like, we're just going to roll for roll with this. Wing so, it! Yes. So just um, for everybody, next week, we've got Marie Jones coming on. We're going to be talking about Toxic Nation, her book. Um, we're going to be talking about the food supply, all the stuff that's in it. Everything from, you know, red dye and how it's bad for you and you shouldn't be drinking it. She's a big name. As I'm drinking it with red dye all over it. Mine's mm. all natural colored. Pineapple, lemon, ginger, and water. Mine's all natural colored. And it's uh, it's until you find out that you know one of those things is probably processed in a you know with ke chemical strippers. The canary's ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're just it's, it's just going to be going about all the stuff that's in the you know the food supply, the things that are you know just it's just across the board. So I think that's going to be you know a real fascinating show and I, I said so we'll we'll have her on and then after that is david pastorius you know i have this i have a disc right here and a base autograph base, yes autograph and i said for base you know bass guitar player um and there's a it's a local group here um, local 518 he actually plays down here too in a group in florida so that's so we'll have him have him on, you know, curse. That was from Mark. Thank you for sending that over. And so, we're what happened on your end, Mark? What you got coming up? Um, next Tuesday on uh, Nightlight on Barbara DeLong .com. You can just, you know, get get uh, to the show at 10, 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern. Um, I have David Brody and we'll be discussing, uh, his last two books, um, uh, the serpent Oracle and Sheba's revenge. And I'm nice. sure we'll segue into some of his other books, the oath of Nimrod, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, out of place artifacts that were found in America. And nope. what he has, uh, I think you had him on more recently than I have. Uh, is he up to like 15 books in his Templars in America series? Yeah, somewhere like, like yeah, somewhere like 15, 16, something like uh, that, I believe. Okay. So, uh, you know, he's your listeners and viewers have. They are they, uh, become familiar with him, and um, you know it's, uh, that's who I, um, my next guest uh, t uh, Tuesday. Uh, I, don't, I don't know who else I have. Do you know the answer to this by any chance, Mark? Brian okay. asked a question about David Pastorius. Is he related to Jacko? Uh, Jacko is his uh, was his uncle. So there you go. So um yeah yeah that uh, that's uh probably going to be one of those questions early on in when david is a guest in a couple weeks um david also plays with um um pat travers band so yep so we'll, we'll be getting on with it so 
um, yeah, so definitely Tuesdays and whenever else they decide to crank out a show, you know, Nightlight was there, you know, it's a oh, mark uh, there. Yeah, and, and the week following, uh, David Brody is Max Hawthorne. Ah, yes. <laughs> so that that'll be that'll be a, a yeah. That'll be a very good show. That's I said. It, he's always fun to talk with, and then. Well, it, it's not as much fun doing uh, <clears throat> Max on the radio because you don't get Mace and Olaf uh, wandering around in front of the camera. It's like, well, it in a way, it just be, takes it back to like the old 50s and 60s radio programs. You're just waiting to hear the crash as, like, you know, as you hear him talking about the cats. And that's, <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it's, <clears throat> that's going to be, that's going to be pretty, pretty good. And I said, and just, you know, let us know when that latest batch of moonshine's done. Mm-hmm. I'll, Chris will take I'll, some. I'll do that. Mothman moonshine. Yeah. Mark Eddy Distillers. There may or may not be a copper still in the back, in his shed back there. You know, just <laughs> so it's yeah. I just when you see you know old tickle showing up with a load of bananas, you know it's uh, you 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 know you know that the moon shining's happening over there. Yeah, I, 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 you know you get to some of these uh, crazy listeners like. Uh, April and chassis, you know, they, they might be uh, some of my delivery uh, uh, drivers as well. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they're near, they're nearby. Vapor vodka. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. But, you know, just everybody, Brian, Joe, King, Alex, you know, go down, go down the list here. Just make sure we don't, you know, Harlan. M.A. Allen. I'm just making sure I'm not missing anybody here. Um, it just, I know. Yeah, they're, just, they're all, uh, you know, loyal listeners. They're yeah, here I just, every week. Th- thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody, you know, Harold, like, to just, I, you guys joining in, you know, with the comments and stuff and things. So really appreciate that. You know, just make sure, like, subscribe, share this, you know, helps us out immensely. You know, just... Once you know, he said, "Thanks for watching." I said, "Just make sure you check us out on threebeardspodcast.com um, and on all social media. We've got TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I know I'm missing something here. Obviously, YouTube, Facebook. I mean, here, Rumble, you're watching or something. Hit Rumble. that bell on. Rumble. Yep. Like, subscribe. Just like Brian, Brian said, like, subscribe, comment, share. It really, it really helps. It seems, you know, even just here." just even having the, you know, simple thing, you know, what's up everybody, you know, helps and it shows engagements and stuff. And it's like, we really, really appreciate that as soon as, you know, trying to get to that thousand. So that way we can, you know, help us grow here. And so we have stuff in the works. Like I said, hopefully we get that stuff out here um, after a while, but you know, redbubble.com three beers podcast is for merchandise or you can go to three beers Check us out on the gear side there. Um, we need, yep. We've, We've got one. Per- I said we got the two beards here. One beard is missing. Yeah, he's missing in action. I'm not sure what happened to him. He's probably under a truck somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. This His is, truck, by the way. Yeah, this truck. is about one of the first shows where the guest and I you know, kind of balanced that. You know, like b- being non-beardos. The smooth face. Yeah. You know. But the question yeah, is, like, can Arlen Roth you- grow a beard? I don't know. I don't, I yeah, we didn't. We we the inquiring minds must know. So, but it, it usually pair me with like you know so, so, some woman researcher, and I, you know, it's, I, I'm not. <laughs> I, it's <sighs> yeah. So and Brian's yeah. over there. He's like, you know, where's Austin? He's filming seventies porn again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 yeah, with that little mu- with that mustache he had there. Going, yeah, it hasn't. Ha- He's full full beard right now, so that's yeah, so he looks a little bit more normal. Although you're gonna have to take our word for it because he's not here. So man, yeah, and I'm still but, working on a porn dildo factory. No, 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 nope, 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 nope. We gotta have something else. I mean, I don't know how many things we gotta plug. I mean, seriously, Jack Daniels. I, you know, I, I, I mean, man, come on. I mean, what do we have to have here? I mean, I even have my beat up Starbucks mug that I've been drinking out here. I mean, what does it take? 
yeah, it's just, it's, I mean, gratuitous plugs for French's mustard, you know, on a, on a show. And it's like not even a peep. I mean, I even shout it out to him on social media. So vodka, yeah, we could, you know, we could always try, try to get on something like that. But yeah, maybe if Mark, you know, can kick off that moonshine business, you know, make it legal this time instead of, you know, under the radar, you know, we could actually hit on him for a sponsorship. <laughs> But I, 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 I think you really need to address a lot of those questions to April. And she's, but she it'll, it'll be, make those kind of concoctions. Well, if he gets caught, moon, you know, stilling, then, you know, it's like we may have to sponsor him because he's going to be behind some. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, it's. Uh, Chris, you know, so hopefully next week, Chris will be, you know, in a much, much better state, not looking like he's getting ready to die. Yeah, I, I said he, he looks, he, he looks half, you know, half out of it right now. So we need to get him out of here. But yeah, we're rebroadcasting ERRT radio courtesy of Ron, you know, appreciate that. You know, that's every Wednesday night at 11 p.m. ish, you know, whenever um, I get done loviating and um, Joey's able to wrap up the show. And so it's, so it's kind of punishing ourselves. So it's, yeah, Joe, I agree. He's, he's saying it's a healthy remedy, but I'm pretty sure there was a health and a heavy dose of vodka mixed in with that health drink. Nah, not tonight. I was yeah. thinking about, a, I was thinking about a hot toddy with Remy, Remy 1738, but um, pass. <laughs> Carolyn, Chris, the snorts reminds me of my bulldog. <laughs> a bully, a Frenchie. <laughs> And then, um, like I said, he put it up there. We're trying to figure out what's going on. Our Patreon thing just kind of like is locked and we're not sure what's going on. So I'm not, I'm not even going to really um, push the Patreon right now. So, but right now that everybody is like sponsoring us stars, Facebook stars works really well. That helps us. I mean, that's, I can go anywhere. I mean, it's a penny a star. So it makes it really easy for anybody that wants to support us and, you know, help keep these beards from looking homely. And we're you worth know. a couple pennies, right? Yeah, yeah. See, it's you know, it's we need like the Sally Struthers things over here. You know, it's like it's, you know, pennies will help a starving beard. We need beard oil. I might dance for some pennies. Yeah, uh, or give us more, and then he, we don't have to watch him dance. Okay, <laughs> and that'll save us all. So that you know, th we'll just do that. The, the more you do, the less likelihood we're going to have to watch him dance. So, all right, everybody, thank you for tuning in, Mark. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, thank <laughs> thank you. No. No, no. Mark's retired. So, all right. So, everybody, have a great night. We will see you next week. Good night.